Faster than a fraudulent performance measure. Stronger than a misplaced decimal point. Able to leap complex compliance requirements at a single bound. It's Super Auditor! Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Auditors Save the World, one audit project at a time, where we bring you thrilling tales of daring audits and brave financial reviews. Here, our heroes don't wear capes, but they do wield the power of empirical evidence. Brought to you by the pros at Yellow Book CPE. In each episode, we interview those legendary auditors who have truly rescued the day. Stay tuned, listeners, because this is one story you won't want to miss. And folks, don't forget to subscribe to our show in your podcast app of choice. And now, here's your host, Lita Hart Fanta. In the heart of the city, where every second counts, one hero stepped up to the challenge. Meet Marcus, the numbers guy, who knew that behind every digit was a life on the line. His mission? Audit 911 response times. Find the gaps and make every moment matter. The results? Lives saved in a city that runs smoother than ever. So how do you do it? Hold on tight because Marcus is about to take us through his story. Thank you so much for joining us today, Marcus. Thank you for having me. I know me. you've got a really interesting story. Yeah, about a 911 audit that you did in a, at a city. Are you able to mention the name of the city? Is that something you can I share? I can. Um, it's it's all public record at this point, and you know my theory okay. is that if it's online and Googleable, <laughs> it is free for discussion at this point. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, so it was Denver, then the city of yes. Denver when you worked for the city of Denver. Yeah. And um, tell me what was going on. Why did you guys choose that as your audit subject? What was going on with nine one one? Oh, once upon a time in the city of County of Denver, uh, I, I was twenty seven. I think the year was around two thousand seven or so. I need to maybe do the math on that, but I, I want to be fair to the current citizens of County of Denver that this may or may not still be applicable and apply. And what had happened is that uh, wow. Right, exactly. Uh, so back in the day, uh, the Denver response times at that time were reaching 30 minutes and oh. folks did not know why at that time. And it was a combination of two things wow. that, that led to this audit. Yeah, exactly. So number one, you hear someone has broken into your home and you're watching the news and you hear that it will take 30 minutes before an officer arrives at your door to respond to that call. So the citizens of Denver were rightfully worried about this. Um, yeah. And I, w I had just been moved to audit supervisor and I was in charge of the Department of Safety, which houses Denver police, fire and, and sheriff at that time, or excuse me, fire, safety, EMS and um, oh. at, at that time. OK. And so that's why the audit was selected for assignment. So Shortly it wasn't an officer, there was also medical and fire. Um, All of it right. took 30 um, minutes. Well, let me be clear. Fire can be carved out of this. Fire is still loving and endeared at that time. <laughs> and I would imagine okay. up to present day, fire was with, without merit. In fact, during the audit, uh, one of the supervisors said, if someone breaks in my house, I'm going to call the fire department because oh, their, their response times were down around seven minutes. So okay. let me oh, okay. you know, let me scope out the fire department. Oh, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> this this is the police department at that police time. Police department. Okay. And what led... And really exploded the interest in this audit. I mean, as you might know, there's a lot of people that aren't very interested in audits over the years. But really what exploded, and it's a, an unfortunate story, is at that time, a husband was having a uh, mental health issue and um, was threatening to kill his wife. Uh -oh. um, and they dialed 9 Well, the wife called 911. This is a recorded tape. And she was asking for an officer to respond. And there was an officer in the area and he was waiting for coverage because it was miscoded as a, uh, I think, a domestic uh, violence issue. Uh, um, but they're supposed to code it. So there's six degrees of coding. And then we can go into details on this. This is all what I learned through the audit. There's six degrees of coding, uh, with you? zero being an officer shot, send, send all officers. Yes. Six is like noise complaint. So right. it was miscoded somewhere between the, uh, that it was basically near a noise complaint. So they were waiting for a second officer to arrive. While that second officer was on his way to arrive to provide coverage for the first officer, the husband in the home pulled out a gun, ended up shooting the wife, the kids uh, in the home, and himself. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, uh. 
Ugh. And so, yeah, that that was well, what really ignited the interest true. in this audit and why, you know, I, I, I learned so much and I still talk about it to this day. Yeah. So no. So the I'm sure the press was all over it. Right. But you yes. were probably the only entity that had the authority to go in and question what was going on. Is that correct? At that time, um, I mean, I guess technically uh, they could have, you know, the um, they could do what they call, I think, a consent decree, which I think at a later point in an unrelated issue, Denver was under at that time. I'm not sure they still do. They had a Denver police the response Justice? monitor. Is mm -hmm. that what yeah, the Department of Justice, of Justice okay. can assign that. OK, um, I don't think that was the case at this time. So okay. I'm going to say, yes, that we would okay. have been the main or only entity that would have been able to go and, and have those rights. And I think what's really good and uh, was fortunate, uh, and I'm really glad that I worked at the Denver Audit Shop, is we had a independently elected auditor. Um, and they had, he was like, I think had a 74% election rate, Den Dennis Gallagher. And wow. so we had a lot of authority that when they called it the Denver Independent Audit Model that I didn't realize. And honestly, One I've lot. lost and, and missed over the course of my career. So we had a lot of authority to request. We had a lot of authority to audit. We were independent. We reported Beautiful. to an independent uh, audit board. And so we were able to go in there and get, to your point, I think, more data and materials and in a timely manner. And whereas the I mean, public really in the news that you were rightfully saying, they could do a public information request. But as you know, to make a good public information request, you have to know what to ask for. Right. So they may say, give me response times. Right. Um, that's that could be millions. I, I think at that point they were doing 600,000, over 600,000 Denver to 911 responses. And that's not including you know, 311 um, each year. Mm, holy cow. Okay. So then the press would have to have the skills to wade through that and analyze the data and the time right. and the money involved in that. Right. And yeah. Right. So how beautiful. They, they would effectively need relationships they they would need an, an internal uh, person um and in what? the absence of that we were fortunate well depending on how much you <laughs> you rely on the press we were fortunate or unfortunate as the auditor's office that they they actually relied on a lot of our information i probably had more press coverage not limited to this audit that ever mm -hmm. in the city and county of denver than i've ever had both before and after that career well that really shows how much they trusted you guys too right Right. Yeah, that's really beautiful. But it is a lot more pressure when they are paying attention yes. to you. But okay. So what did you find? What was the what was going on? In our pump thirty minutes. So effectively, yeah, the audit had uh two major findings. Um uh, folks will have to find that uh, the audit report to, to go through what those findings are. But I do remember the details of the audit and, and functionally what had happened is they weren't hiring officers. So uh, like I said, I think this was around 2008, 2009, as you know, some of our uh, more mature audience like myself will remember that was the housing crisis. You know, we were in the middle of a recession and they weren't hiring enough officers, most importantly. Uh, so there's, th I think, three type of officers and including civilians. So they weren't putting enough officers in vehicles on the road. So that was very important. There wasn't enough officers available to respond to 911 calls in the city of County in Denver at that time. Because they didn't that have just tax revenue? Result. Oh, that was a result of? No, it was two issues. Number one, um, they weren't hiring enough to meet their attrition. So they were just through natural attrition and retirement, they were lo losing about 30 officers a year. So their workforce would have shrunk by 30 officers a year if nothing happened. Mm. So I think this was over the, from 2010. Uh, I think we looked at a five year period. So that uh, they were lost uh, what, 80 officers uh, or 150. They would have lost 150 officers through nothing but attrition, period. So that's 150 officers removed from the streets. In addition to that, they also weren't doing uh, what they call police academies. Oh. And even if they did a police academy, they only did about 30 officers. So they would have had to do at least one academy a year just to break even. And they hadn't done any in the last three to five years. Wow. All due to budget limitations, all due to funding. Budget, politics. I mean, yeah, I think especially folks in government auditing, you, you know the games. But what had happened was uh, it was mostly budget. Um, but the interesting thing was our audit was the first time that in, uh, well, 
first public, I should say. I'm sure they were doing internal analyses. First public release audit and objective, as you mentioned earlier, data where by the end of our audit, we recommended here is the attrition rates. Here is, and I had a great data analyst who got it down to, I think, three seconds. Here is how many officers you need to put on the street to improve response times by three seconds and the difference that would make. And he got it down to, like, if it was raining and if it was snowing and all these variables. really? Wow. They had a new chief of police. And he analyzed all those changes over that five-year period as a graphic in the report. And he was, we were the first one that said, here's how many officers you need. Here's how much it will cost you flat rate. Here's how much it will cost you with retirement and pension. If you want to reduce response times by two minutes, hire this many officers uh, for 27 wow. million, hire this many officers. So that's why I think this audit resonated so much. Right? Yeah. And what did they do with that information? Didn't you have some kind of conflict with the chief of police or something? <laughs> What's that? Do I remember? Uh, I, I did. Yeah, I did. It was, this was the, the most uh, fascinating audit for me personally as well. Uh, so the conflict I had with the chief of police, he, he had just started. Uh, so I was a new supervisor. I'm 27 years old. And, and I, I feel like that's critical, uh, both in age and, and both in ignorance. I like it. <laughs> ignorance is bliss. Sure, yeah. uh, so I, I probably did a better audit then with less fear than I would do now at this age. I'd be wiser, <laughs> but I'd have more fear because I know the consequences. <laughs> Yeah. But I, I remember one day he uh, in planning, he called me uh, and, and this wasn't our first encounter. Uh, he called me on the phone and and I described it as him calling me everything but a child of God. <laughs> and it got to a point where he it was so I didn't even know. I didn't know where this call was going. Uh, I put it on speakerphone. I'm like, is this guy going to threaten to kill me before this, <laughs> this call is over? And so he's rambling. He's he, oh, he's rambling and ranting. Uh, I'm sure he thought he had a point to it. And I, I'm just kind of staring at the phone. Me, by this time, me and my team have surrounded the phone. And um, at some point... He had a break, which I think was a breath. And I used that as an opportunity to jump in. Oh, wow. and um, I so I, what's good is I had worked in criminal justice and law enforcement before. So I was prepared. I was caught off guard, but I was prepared for this conversation. And I said something to the effect of uh, Chief White. I mean, which again, once again, public record, you can look this. Up. I was like, Chief White, none of that is true. Wow. Uh, and even if it was at any point during this engagement, if you feel that anyone on my team is being unobjective or biased in this work, you can go to my boss. Here is his name and information. That's if smart. you feel that I am being unbiased. Yeah. In this work, you can go to my boss. Here yeah. is the, his name and his information. Yeah. And if you need to go above any of these parties, here's how you go about doing so. And here's how you file reports in the city of county and Denver. And there was an additional but I feel like more elongated silence <laughs> there. And uh, he started laughing. And what I what I heard, at least, is this cryptic laugh, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like one of those things you hear right in a, <laughs> in a Halloween movie before you know, right. transition to like a door breaks open. And so <laughs> actually, I'm on the other side. The call is coming from in the office, you know. Ah. And um, he was like, you know what, Mr. Garrett, uh, or you might have called me Marcus or maybe you didn't call me Mr. Garrett. That, that might have been too, too much to credit to give me. He's like, you know, you're all right. Oh, I appreciate your time or something to that effect. Uh, but I think what he and I've learned a lot over the years, he wanted to be heard and he wanted to yeah. be respected. And I think that oh. was absent in a lot of areas. And that oh, well. I mean, he didn't we didn't become friends. He didn't invite me to any weddings. You know, I wasn't at any christenings <laughs> after that. <laughs> but but the tone of the engagement improved to allow us to do the work that we needed to do. And now a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Yellow Book CPE, the heroes behind the jumbo bundle of self-study courses. With a one-year subscription, you get access to over 170 hours of top-notch CPE content. Dive into thrilling tales of agile, IT auditing, fraud, and internal controls. All courses carry NASBA's quality seal, so you know they've got the superpower of trustworthiness. Just click the link in the description to sign up. And now, back to our story. Yeah. How did you not, how did he feel like you had not respected him so far by the way the project was announced, the way his colleagues were talking about it? What had triggered him and what do you think could have kept that from happening, kept him from having that moment of blowing up? 
What do you think? Looking back. I'll, I'll answer at the end and work backwards. I don't think that moment could have been. Okay, let's help yeah, you. I don't think that moment could have been prevented. Oh, okay. And I, in some ways, I think that moment was needed and necessary. Uh, I think that blow up was going to happen in some way, shape or form somewhere in this audit engagement. And it was probably better that it happened in planning on a phone call that, you know, besides he said, she said my word, his word. No one really knows what was or was not said. Gotcha. Uh, I think that needed to happen because it might have happened in the public. It might have happened at the audit debrief. It might have happened when we released the report. Oh. So in some ways, okay. it needed to happen. I, w I wouldn't go as far to say I'm glad it happened because it was very nerve wracking. You know, a tw sure. 27 year old being yelled at by the chief of police in the city of County Denver is a little bit weird. Yep. <laughs> Am I going to make it home tonight? <laughs> exactly. Got it. And so... Um, but, but that being said, uh, I think I and the team handled that well. And I, I think the result of that is if nothing else, even if they didn't believe us, I think he was the chief and, I, and really the police department. I mean, they were under a lot of pressure response time in Denver. They were being accused of not responding with, within 30 minutes. Uh, they were under a lot of pressure. You're right. The press was on there and there was a, a homicide as a result of this exact issue. Oh, okay. yeah. So I yeah. think I was pretty empathetic then. I might have even grown more empathetic over time with age and like, man, they were under a lot of pressure. And I'm just this 27 year old supervisor um, looking and really questioning their work as an auditor, but they kind of just see me as this outsider coming in and questioning their work. Yeah. The result of that, which I, I so um, that's how I would answer from the end of the beginning. I'm not sure that that could have changed. But I will say one thing that happened at the end of the engagement, and this was after the report was out, uh, the city and county of Denver actually asked me to come back. So th <laughs> not, not related, but this is roughly around my last audit, too. But I, I, I left the city and county of Denver to go back to Texas, not running from the chief of police. Two unrelated stories. <laughs> I, I was already planning. <laughs> They're like, oh, he had to flee back to Texas. <laughs> like, I was already planning to go back to Texas. Uh, and they, they called me back if I would come to city council and talk about this audit. And like you're saying here, the methodology and how we came to the results. Oh. Uh, they ended up getting like three academies. Uh, basically, they ended up getting the officers and resources that they needed because they now had the data and evidence to support it. Oh, that's really and, good. And uh, yeah, my staff auditor, I, I was back in Texas. Was that same still there? The same chief? He was. Okay. He was. Did he? But he didn't thank you, I'm sure. <laughs> he did not. The the closest I got to a compliment was actually not even to me. I'm not even sure the chief knows that I know this. Uh, he saw my staff auditor uh, at one point and he was like, hey, I haven't, what's going on? I haven't seen Marcus in a while. Um, and he's like, oh yeah, he doesn't work for us anymore. He's, he's back in Texas. Now the telephone game, uh, I don't know if this was actually said, but my staff auditor said, the chief said, you know, I always liked that guy. <laughs> Oh, what? <laughs> to, what? To this, yes. That is cool. To this day. <laughs> yeah, to this day, I've been trying to figure out, like, you know, if he liked me, if he liked me, yeah, <laughs> how did he yeah. treat people that he disliked? <laughs> well, most auditors are not liked. Most, those right. are the kind of people do not, yeah. But you won him over with <laughs> your integrity and your really uh, good I would, Yeah. You're really good. I, I wouldn't go that far, but he did get money and he did get resources. So I think it's hard yeah. to dislike someone who gets you money and resources uh, uh, to hold a grudge against that person over the long term. <laughs> yeah, you're mentioning being young, which is, uh, and not having an appreciation for what the entity is going through. And I yeah. see that a lot. You and I both see that a lot, where if you haven't tried to run a program or do something on your own and you're coming in and just kind of judging, it's real easy to do that. And it's real easy to, sorry about the pun, cop an attitude <laughs> about the audit fee. Right. So what have you learned over time? What do you keep in mind when you're talking to an auditee? Some of it, I truly do think, uh, and, I, and I hate to be that guy, but some of it I do think is age, like the, the wisdom yeah. of going through an audit like this and then yeah. seeing 10, 20 years, how different entities operate and, and how different people receive a report. Uh, the actual example I'll use is present day. Uh, I'm being audited right now uh, at, at work. Yeah. Fine. And I won't say the company, but it's one of the big four. 
Okay. And it sucks. Ah. And they're fairly annoying. And I would say a little bit yeah. inconsiderate. <laughs> and I think it's, yeah. it's yeah. I've worked with auditors like this, but it, it seems like they're just, they're after something. They're like, I know something's here. And there's not something here. Right. They're asking the questions and I'm an auditor. They're asking the questions in a way I didn't really understand. Oh. So I answered what I thought was the question. And when I better understood the question, I was like, oh, I sent you the wrong thing here's the right thing. Mm. And they're like, well, then why did you send us the first thing? And I'm like, because Vicious. I was like, I, I admit you got it. Uncle, the list is wrong. <laughs> here's the right list. And now we're in this weird circle. Well, what, why was the first list wrong? And I, I was like, yeah. And so anyway, um, I think <laughs> there is a gotcha. Yeah, you know, they were definitely, yeah, definitely exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's gotcha auditors. And I've always tried to not be a gotcha auditor. I will get you if there's something to get, but I don't try to be the auditor that, you know, like everyone's a, everyone's a fraud. Everyone, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I try to get the fraudsters right. and separate people reasonably trying to do their jobs yeah. from the fraudsters. <laughs> So you, yeah, yeah, you, it's different. You, you learn through time. You learn through working. You learn to learn ideally. I mean, this this auditor's probably. It wouldn't surprise me if this auditor's twenty seven, <laughs> <laughs> and now they are the form of karma <laughs> coming back to me. Back when I was trying to get you, and I was a gotcha auditor. <laughs> um, and so, as you alluded to, and I've moved up, and and I have the opportunity to both train and uh, both have audit team. I've been a supervisor. I've been a, a director. Is I try to I try to make that a very important part of the coaching and mentorship that actually most people are doing the right thing. Yeah. I would say it's probably nine I'm ninety five percent confident yeah, that most too. people are doing the right thing. Or trying to at least. Yeah. Yeah. Let's conduct our engagement sort of the with that in mind. And if we find that five percent Hey, let the dogs loose, <laughs> be pin the ears back. You can be the gotcha auditor all you want. Um, but the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, I guess is the quote that I would use here. <laughs> Say that again. The, as the absence of evidence is what? The absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Oh. It is probably timely that the cops are flying cops by are, right now. <laughs> oh, this is something to get you now that you've talked about. It exactly. With? You're safely in exactly. Your, so we're okay. You should you should leave that in because that was very timely. <laughs> and I, I unfortunately I feel that too many auditors move in in that scope that the, that that absence of evidence is the evidence of absence that because I can't find something I need to search more I need to be harder on this client because they're hiding something from me I just haven't found it yet. That is not how I conduct audits. That's not even what I believe in as an individual or as an right. auditor. Um, right, right, right. I go that's where the evidence takes me. That's good. That's great. I think that some auditors start off thinking that they are fraud investigators, but that's what our job is. And it's not to provide assurance, which means that the assurance could be everything's fine here, you know, or the assurance could be everything's fine here. This could be a little smoother. You know, I think that some auditors don't feel good unless they rake somebody across the, over the coals. And that's uh, that's never going to go over well with the auditee and it's just going to lengthen the audit. And yeah. I agree with you. And, and I've had a lot of great conversations in the field of audit. And uh -huh. I've been in the field long enough to kind of, I think, even see a change in this. Uh -huh. But, you know, they're called audit findings. We are geared, we are taught, at least I was to find something right um we are set up and so it was actually probably it was definitely not in the beginning it was um further in my career than probably would have been good for me to be a good auditor before i learned oh you can have audits without findings the finding as you pointed out yeah. can be there is no finding that the criteria aligns yeah and as a result of that especially with young auditors who are like eager to quite literally find and have an audit finding, they're searching for that justification because I'm taught to write audit finding. I had a five elements of a finding yeah. and I got to fill out. I need, I need all five of those elements filled out or I might get written up. Like I'll be in trouble. Yeah. yeah. And I, 
I still hear to this day, even my father who's retired, it, he still says, uh, and I'm his son, he, but he said, yo, y'all got to find something. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's, he's a recipient. He's a client. He's like, those auditors got to find something. And I, I cannot say he's incorrect Yeah, yeah. Um, in, a lot, in more cases than I would like to see. Well, my husband used to work for a builder and the in city inspectors would come in and the city of Austin inspectors are notorious for hanging projects up. They're just terrible. Yeah. And so what he would do was he, because they always had to they find fall. something with his jobs, they couldn't find anything because he was, he's detailed that way. Yeah. So what he started to do is just sort of loosen some doorknobs <laughs> and did some really simple stuff so that the inspector would find something to put in his report so he would go away. Everybody's got to do their job. Right. And that was the inspector's job. And they couldn't leave until they found something. You know, we don't want to audit like that, obviously. Right. Because of this, this objective that you had, this 911 audit, such an important engagement. Right. That objective is significant. I mean, it's just so good. I was working with one state auditor who was auditing the sheriff's department and they were auditing budget transfers year over year every time they went to go visit. Although they had the auditor had ability to look at everything while just 200 yards away from them in the prison, inmates were dying in custody, mm. right? Yeah. So the significance of your work too matters. Right, like, right. what are you spending your time doing? Are you looking at budget transfers or are you looking at and digging in? And of course, everywhere you look, you're going to find something like a loose doorknob. So you better be careful where you look. You better make sure you look at things like 911, like you did. Right. It's a fabulous work. And you made a difference. You ultimately made a difference to the citizens of Denver. Has anybody else used your data analytics or your work as a basis for their audit that you know of? Because that graphic sounds really good. Not that I know of. Yeah. Um, no one has contacted me directly. I, I've done a, I mean, this is the engagement that I speak about the most because I think it, it combines so many elements that'll be, a, it was applicable in 2014. And, you know, as you're pointing out, response times are of interest to this day. They'll be of interest probably for the next hundred years. Yep. I would say that that methodology would still apply. And I'm assume, I assume like most auditors. So if today I was handed a Denver response or excuse me, if I was handed a response time audit for the city of Houston, I would type in what are audits looking at response times across the country. I'd be very surprised if this wasn't out there and one of the top because of all the speaking engagements that I've done on it, the solid methodology, as you said, the impact that it had. Well, um, and so no one, no affirmations. I'd be surprised if folks haven't relied on it. And, and I know they've done follow-ups in the city and county of Denver specifically. That's wonderful. Good job, Marcus. <laughs> Did you tell your dad the story? Did I tell my dad what? This story, did you oh, tell he, him? Yeah, he's, 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 yeah, he's very aware. He, he, he finds it funny. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also really proud of you, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. He, he's really interested in the work I've done. And I think what fascinates him, as I said, as a client, as a recipient of all audits, and now as a retiree and commenter on the state of the world and affairs, is that... I I think he, you know, I'm, I'm one of the good ones, if you will, that I'm, yeah. I'm one of the auditors. I'm not one of the gotcha auditors. So I, he biased towards me being his son, my, my mother as well, who worked in nursing. You know, they're audited all the time as a registered nurse. Um, they're, I think they are probably proud that they raised a not gotcha auditor. Yeah. What does your dad do for a living? He was actually the chairman for the Boards of Pardon and Paroles under criminal justice. He worked his oh, way wow. up through the criminal justice system. Okay, gosh. Okay, so he knows a lot about how important the work of government is. Like he's protecting all of those people in his care, right? Yes. And he gets audited and, by the Texas State Auditor's Office, I assume, and his internal auditor. And and um, for a brief time there, when I came out of college, I, I did audits for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And those were, I mean, those... Um, you know, they're, all our audits are beautiful children, but those, those were some of the more interesting ones that I, I've done yeah. over the years. Because you're right, just the the vast scope of work, uh, and in that case, and like ability. the audit uh, for Denver, Nine. yeah, you're you're literally in charge of lives. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and so those were huge. some of the more fascinating audits that I've done. I audited at TDCJ too when I was with the Texas State Auditor's Office. That was a fascinating audit. Yep. We were there all summer in Huntsville. Is that where your dad is? Is yep. he in Huntsville? 
Wow. Uh, I was bo- I was born in Huntsville. Uh, they're they're on the no outskirts way. of uh, Houston now. Yeah, I was born wow, in Huntsville, and I, I I went to Sam Houston Go Bearcats. <laughs> so oh, nice. I went to uh, Sam nice. Houston as well. So I, I you know, returned to the homeland to graduate and try to make a small difference. Well, you are making a difference. Thank you, Marcus, for being with us today. That was a great story. Thank you, brave listeners, for joining us on this adventure. We appreciate your loyalty. Take a moment to subscribe and share this podcast with all your audit allies. And don't miss out on Yellow Book CP's upcoming webinars. Because every superhero needs their training. And Yellow Book CPE offers continuing education that's relevant, convenient, and as thrilling as the fight for justice. Until next time, audit on. Audit on.